God, for your worship now. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray that you're pleased. Amen. Well, it's so good to see everyone today. You know, at Heartland, we focus on the Bible. We believe that it is truly the revelation of God, that it is God's word, that everything we need is in the Bible. The Bible is God's love letter to you. And everything in the Bible is about How God, your creator, pursues you with relentless love. It's a love beyond anything that we could imagine. It's well beyond anything that we deserve. And if you will think about this, it was man, God's crowning Glory of creation. It was man created perfect without any needs in a garden paradise. It was man who doubted God. Man who questioned God's goodness and ultimately chose of his own free will to turn his back on the creator. And the result was that that sin broke the intimate relationship between man and holy God. And the result, it was the most far-reaching, most devastating thing that has ever occurred. Because the result was that into the human race came sin and chaos and evil, and sickness, and death. But God's love is so amazing. His grace is so amazing that he made a way of escape that we could be restored to a right relationship with him. That we could again have fellowship with God, our creator. That we could experience forgiveness that we could have abundant life now and eternal life in a perfect heaven that God has prepared for his children. Everything in the scriptures point to the cross and the resurrection. Everything in the Bible points to the good news of the gospel message where Jesus became our Savior on that cross and where he conquered through his resurrection the plague of sin and death forever. And I tell you this because we today, with the completed revelation of the Bible, and by the way, maybe maybe you're kind of at a point in life where you're like, I don't know about if the Bible is true. Isn't it something that man maybe just made up? I would encourage you to go to the website, myheartland.org, and just invest the time to listen to a previous sermon, previous podcast that I did called How Can We Be Sure the Bible is True? If you're not really certain, you owe it to yourself to investigate that because everything depends on it. And we, with this completed revelation called the Bible, we should be the generation of the most unshakable, greatest faith because unlike those of the past, as it all was unfolding, today we get to see where you live in the line, the timeline of human history. We get to see the whole marvelous plan of God. It's unveiled in the scripture. We get to see what he is really like and what he has done. And that's why if you look in your 
Bibles or if you look in the white sheet in your bulletin, the outline. Romans 15, 4 says that everything that was written in the past, the scriptures in the past, was written to teach us. So that through the endurance, that is people keeping their faith in God, taught in the scriptures, and the encouragement that they, by their faith, what happened when they believed God? That through the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. That means confidence. And this is one of the reasons that we need to read and study the scriptures. It's one of the reasons that as a church family, we are committed to studying the Bible. When you come here on Sunday, my job is to not to try to get a giant crowd that I can entertain. My job is to not to try to say things that will make me feel good or even that would make you feel good. My job, my calling, my role is to help teach the incredible truths of the scripture so that we can all grow and change. God uses the miracle of the, of the scripture by his spirit. And so as we look at the Bible, we begin to see how God worked in the lives of believers before us. In other words, we have, if we'll take advantage of it, we have the great benefit of hindsight in seeing the God of the universe at work. Now I'm going to use an analogy that some of you can close your ears to because it's a sports analogy. But I think it's appropriate, even though it's an imperfect analogy. And it's about hindsight. It's about faith. Those of you who watched the Super Bowl last Sunday, and can I just ask for a show of hands, how many you watched the game? Okay. <laughs> Those of you who did not, raise your hands. Just pretend you've got a shoulder injury. Something happened. That's why you didn't do that. But those of you who watched the game, I want you to try to think and remember for a minute what you felt like at about the eight-minute mark of the fourth quarter. Now, I, honestly, I want you to think about that. Some of you said, you know what? You just threw your nachos down and said, <laughs> Some of you sat there thinking, I got to see it out to the end. There's not, I mean, it's against all odds. It's, not, it's never happened before that a team could come back like this and this few minutes to go in the fourth quarter of the biggest game of the year. It's probably not going to happen, but maybe. Some of you believed. You believed. And you know why you believed? You believed because of the game before that. And you believed because of the game before that. You, and before that. But two games before that, you saw a team come back against all odds from 24 points down. That can't happen, but you saw it, and you believed it, and there were thousands and millions of witnesses. And the next game, it happened again. So in that third Super Bowl game, as you were looking at that deficit and that time clock, your mind was also thinking back, this has happened before. Maybe it can happen again. That hindsight, that look back, gave you some hope, maybe a little, maybe a lot, but some hope that against all odds, this would occur. And it did. Now, that's an imperfect analogy. Because as much as you like Patrick Mahomes, he is not, of his own admission, the Savior. And you may have been praying to God, Lord, please. And you may have been counting on people in San Francisco not praying. You may have been thinking, God, and you might have been praying specifically, Lord, Mahomes to heal. Oh, Lord. But it didn't happen that way. It happened a different way. Maybe you weren't praying for Williams to score a touchdown, but he did. And you did not sit there and say, oh, man, I was praying that it would be Hill. Oh, no. You were glad that it happened. 
Now, I say all of that, those of you who are hating football, tune back in. I say all that because the scriptures in a far, far greater way is story after story after story, witness after witness after witness, testimony, testimony, proof, infallible proof again and again that God is victorious. God is faithful. God's timing is always perfect. God is always in control. And the end result can never be affected. For you right now to look back at the score of last week's game and believe it does not take nearly as much faith as it did when there was eight minutes to go. But it's true nonetheless. One of the things I want you to see as we go through this book of Joshua is that whatever situation you are in right now, against all odds, God is worthy of your trust. He has proven himself again and again. And today as we begin our study of the book of Joshua, it might run through your mind because some of you have read Joshua, some of you have studied Joshua, some of you have never looked at Joshua, some of you might remember stories when you were a kid and you know a couple of the stories, you know, Josh fought the battle of Jericho and that's kind of what you know about Joshua. The walls came tumbling down. Or you might remember something about Rahab. But you might be thinking to yourself, why do I want to look and study and spend time on something that occurred 3,000 years ago, how's that going to help me today? Well, I hope as we dig into this that you will not only see how God has worked all through human history, but that you will see who he is and how he wants to work in your life today. And that you will see clearly that it is all about Jesus from start to finish. So let's pray together as we begin this journey and our campaign in the book of Joshua. Father, we thank you and praise you that we live in a time where we can see what you have revealed and what you have done. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would strengthen our faith. We pray that we would have an unshakable faith in you, no matter what the odds, that our trust in you would not waver because you are worthy. Lord, I pray that you would minister by your spirit through your word in the hearts of each individual who is looking to you today, would you be real to us? And may you receive glory and honor through our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, as you know, there are 66 books of the Bible, and you really gain a lot more if you take a book of the Bible and you see the context in which it occurs. And so we have to take a little a little pre-look here, I'm going to ask your forbearance, and we're going to take a little trip through the Bible, but I think it will really help us see the import of Joshua as it occurs. Let's go all the way back. Actually, we can't go all the way back because we'd have to go to eternity past, which we can't comprehend, a time when there was only God. He was not in need of anything or anyone, he chose in his love to create. And when he created man, he created him perfect, and he said that everything he created was very good. He created man to have fellowship with him. He was created innocent in the garden paradise in need of nothing, but with a free will. 
God did not create robots who had no choice to love because love, true love, must be a choice. But man failed, and the result was that sin and death entered the human race. Man was expelled from the garden, and as man began to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, man was allowed to be guided by his conscience. And that finally resulted in Genesis chapter 6 telling us that violence and wickedness was everywhere. And Genesis 6, 5 says, Every inclination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil all the time. Man left to himself under conscience was disastrous. The result was the worldwide flood. As Noah, the one who believed in his family, began to repopulate the earth again, man was under human government. Nations were formed. The Bible says that everyone spoke one language. And by the way, linguistical experts outside of the Bible attest to that fact. They trace the commonality of all languages back to one that they call Sumer Akkadian. But man decided under Nimrod that he could take over. And he began building a tower to heaven, the Tower of Babel. And Genesis 11 tells us the result of that was that God confused the languages and scattered the nations so that man could not unite with one communication in rebellion. Which brings us to Abraham. Abraham was a man who had incredible faith in the one true God no matter what else was going on around him. All around him, everyone decided to turn away from God and make up their own God. Even Abraham's own father-in-law worshipped the moon as God. But not Abraham. And Abraham would become the father of God's family. And from his offspring would one day come a savior of the world. So all the way back in Genesis 12, we read this. The Lord had said to Abram, before his name was changed to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household, to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Now man had invented gods of all kinds and was even worshiping the creation rather than the creator. Imagine this, how unenlightened people were way back then, unlike today. They were worshiping the stars as if horoscope could really be their god. Now we're well too advanced to do anything like that today. They were worshiping in pantheism, they were worshiping creation. Like I see God in the mountains and I see God in the hills. We're way too advanced to do anything like that today. And so as they did that, and they moved further and further away from God, God would step in to separate a people for his name. A chosen people, not any more loved, but chosen for a specific purpose, to reveal who he is. And Abraham would be the father of that nation. Verse 3, we read that God said, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse you. That has proven true throughout history to this day. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So God promised Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation and that through his offspring, the Messiah would come, the Savior, and all the nations of the world would be blessed and that they would have a promised land to live in, a land flowing with milk and honey, that is, abundance. Well, that's impossible 
That's crazy. Because as the years drug by, Abraham and Sarah had no children, and they were past the age of childbearing. And God promised again and again that he would provide a miracle. A miracle would happen. They would have a son. When Sarah understandably laughed about this, like, yeah. God said, is anything too hard for the Lord? Well, is it? Nothing is impossible with God, the Bible says. And Abraham was told that his offspring would be so many that he couldn't even count them. And Abraham, against all odds, in verse 6, believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness, the Bible says. But more years went by and still no son. Later in Genesis 15, 7, God appeared to Abraham in a vision and said, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans, so out of this little desert place you're in, to give you this land to take possession of it. And then God repeated to him that a miracle would happen, that he would not only have a son, but a promised land. Verse 18, on that day the Lord made a covenant, an agreement with Abram and said, to your descendants, even though Abraham had no children, yet I give this land. Well, he's standing in the middle of the desert. And the land God's talking about is inhabited by the most fierce warriors in the world. I give you this land from the Wadi River of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. A huge swath of land that was inhabited by those who hated God. And guess what? Not with eight minutes to go, not with four minutes to go, not even with one minute to go. When Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90, Isaac was miraculously born. Isaac grew up and had Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Jacob had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. And later, after Abraham proved his faith by being willing, if necessary, to sacrifice his precious son Isaac, just before it happened in Genesis 22, God intervened. He stepped in and he provided a substitute, sacrificial lamb, foreshadowing what was to one day happen when God would step in and sacrifice as our substitute his own son on the cross. And God said to Abraham at that time in Genesis twenty two seventeen, 17, I will surely, that means it's as certain as the sun coming up, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, that is the seed. This is the very beginning of the Bible promises that started in Genesis 3. As soon as Adam failed, God said the promised seed would be coming. He repeats here. It just keeps unfolding as the Bible is completed and we see the whole picture. Through your offspring or seed, all nations on earth will be blessed. But... Remember, we read Romans 10 that says what happened in the past that's written is for our strength, well, how they endured, how they kept their faith. Well, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob lived their entire lives owning no more than a burial plot of land, but still trusting in God's promise that he repeated again and again. Now, God had told Abraham in Genesis 15, 13 what was going to happen. It's not in your notes, but let me read it to you. Genesis 15, 13, God said, Know for certain 
that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, Egypt, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. Verse 14 says, But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out. That is, there will be an exodus. The second book of the Bible is all about that. They will exit. God is prophesying and telling them what is going to happen. They will come out with great possessions. Now the book of Genesis ends with Abraham's descendants in slavery to a cruel Pharaoh or king in Egypt. But at every step, listen, at every step, just like in your life, God was at work. He was at work in ways they did not see. He was at work in ways that they did not know. He was at work preparing and protecting and shaping them and preparing the world for a Savior. Toward the end of those 400 years, God raised up a descendant of Abraham, one of his offspring named Moses, to lead the people through a series of miracles, including the blood being placed in the shape of a cross so that the angel of death would pass over them. And he led them out. Through this series of miracles, all of this occurred until the final miracle. When they came with the Egyptian army hot on their heels and pinned in with a mountain range and a desert and a sea in front of them, no hope. But God will always make a way. And the Red Sea was parted in one of the greatest of all miracles. And they went to freedom. And then through Moses at Mount Sinai, God makes a covenant agreement with his people. He gives them commandments by which to live by so that they would not be like the other people who were doing everything you can imagine. They were even sacrificing their own children to the gods they had made. God gave them commandments. You know them. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. He told them what was right and wrong. And they, they promised to serve and worship him with all their hearts. And God promised to protect them and keep his promise to Abraham. God had told Abraham this back in Genesis 15, 16, before Abraham even had the first son, Isaac. God said in the fourth generation, now in, those, in that context, a generation was 100 years, so 400 years later, your descendants, remember Abraham doesn't even have a son yet when this was written, will come back here, that is to the land God promised. Why is it going to be 400 years? Because the sin of the Amorites, now that was the dominant people in the promised land. There were many others, Hittites, Canaanites, Havites, Termites, everything you can imagine, but they were just called one name here. Uh, people in the promised land uh, that has not yet reached its full measure. The people got worse and worse and worse and more and more depraved and wicked until finally the only recourse was judgment. But we'll get to that. But, as you know, if you've read some of the Bible, after miraculously being delivered from Egypt, after the Exodus, the chosen people of Israel, no matter that they had promised, they did not obey God. They complained and they doubted and they murmured and they rebelled. They even worshipped a golden calf that they made themselves and said, this is the God who delivered us. And many other things. And so they had to wander in the desert between Egypt and the promised land of Canaan for 40 years 
until the entire generation over age 20 died off. They had been afraid to enter the promised land because of the formidable foes who lived there, literally giant warriors in walled, fortified cities. And at one point, Moses sent 12 spies out to check out the land and report back what they had seen. And when they came back, they told the people, it's, there's no way. It's impossible. Even if God's on our side, this can't be done. And they convinced the people to also doubt and question God. All of them were afraid. All of them would not believe God. All of them except two. Joshua and Caleb. The fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy, ends with Moses, before he dies, passing the role of leader to Joshua. And this is where the book of Joshua begins. There's important history leading up to it. The people of God are at the front door of the promised land and God is about to fulfill his long-awaited promise to give Israel the land and make it a great nation from which the Savior would one day come. And that brings us to Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. Let's read together. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. Now, some of you may not like your parents, but at least you had parents. Joshua was the son of Nun. I've been waiting five years to use that joke. <laughs> Probably could have waited another five. In, <laughs> in your notes, you'll see that the name Joshua actually means that the Lord saves or the Lord is salvation. Joshua, though he was a real person, Joshua is a type or a foreshadowing of Jesus. The Old Testament name Joshua is translated in the New Testament, Yahshua, Jesus, who would save or rescue his people. You may, you may remember that when the angel appeared to Joseph before that first Christmas 2,000 years ago and Joseph had just found out Mary was pregnant and the angel said in Matthew 1.20, Joseph, son of David, and it went all the way back to Abraham. But Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, she will give birth to a son. It will be a miracle. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus or Joshua because he will save his people from their sins. God continues in verse 2 of Joshua. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready. There's a preparation that has to occur. We're going to be looking at it next week. God wants to prepare you to do great things for him. Get ready to cross the Jordan River. Now this was impossible, as again we'll look at next week. It was at flood stage. This, and there's a walled city of warriors on the other side. This is not humanly anything you would do. Get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. In verse 3, <clears throat> I will give you <clears throat> excuse me, every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. God had repeated the same promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses. Verse 4, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. Now we'll look at this in more detail, but on this map, this is a huge stretch of land. At the top part of that map, you can't even see it. 
where it says Lebanon, and then you got to go down a little further, is Israel. Israel's only about the size, even today, of New Jersey. Where Joshua is standing is just a speck on the map. And God is saying, I am going to give you all of this. This will be your promised land. Verse 5. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, even though Joshua had been prepared by God to become the new leader, can you imagine? Put yourself in his spot. Can you imagine the fear and the worry that he must have had? How could anyone replace Moses? What if the people rejected him? Or if they rebelled against God? How can he do this enormous task? What God has called him to do across the Jordan River, if they can even cross it? Are the fiercest fighting warriors in the world behind walled cities? It seemed and it was humanly impossible. But God understood Joshua's human weakness, his need. And I want you to hear this. He understands yours. The Bible says we don't have a high priest to go between who can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, our weaknesses, our needs. Jesus feels what you feel. He understood Joshua and he reassures him as he does you. It's repeated in Hebrews 13, 5. I will be with you. I will never. And in the Bible, it's actually double negative and emphatic. I will never, no, never under any circumstances, ever, leave you or forsake you. God, listen, this, this right here might be what God wants some of you here today to hear. Because he's always trying to talk to us, speak to us. Not audibly, but he's trying to communicate with us through the noise. And when you're in church, it's a time for a little bitty time that you can just focus a little bit on God. And so here's a truth that we, that we must internalize. God will never ask you or call you to do anything without giving you the resources, the assurance, the power to carry it out if you will look to him. He may be asking you to love that unlovable person. He may be asking you to resist that seemingly irresistible temptation. He may be asking you to step out in faith and do something. If he's calling and asking you to do that, he will provide everything you need. And nothing can stop it. Proverbs 21.30 says, There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. He will bring to pass his purposes. Now, there are some great themes in Joshua that we're going to kind of weave into these next eight weeks. I want to just give a quick overview, a little bit of five of them. The first one you see in your outline is redemption. Redemption. The people of Israel were in slavery in Egypt. Now remember, in the Bible, you might remember when we studied prophecy, Egypt in the Bible is always symbolic of the world. And so the Israelites were in slavery in Egypt, suffering without any hope, and God reached down and miraculously rescued them. Well, today, in a far broader sense, God has redeemed. To redeem means to buy back with a ransom. God has redeemed or bought us back out of our hopeless suffering from the slave market of sin. 
He has delivered us to freedom. And the cost was the innocent, holy lifeblood. That was the payment. That's what you owed. He paid it as your substitute. That's why if you want forgiveness, if you want eternal life, you better quit trying to think, I'm going to try to be good. I'm going to do the best I can. I'll try to go to church and maybe get baptized. Maybe if I give money or I'll try to do good deeds, you'll end up as a quote unquote good person in hell forever separated from God. Because none of that will ever get you to heaven. You only can go to heaven. You can only have forgiveness. If you realize you are hopeless, there is nothing you can do. You need a Savior. And until you are broken and you come to Jesus Christ and you say, have mercy on me, a sinner, I have no other way. I am trusting in Jesus as my substitute, as my ticket, as the one who paid the way for me. I'm putting all my trust in him and him alone. Jesus, will you be my Savior? Then you become a child of the living God, forgiven, forever a part of his family. It is that simple. Oh, it's not cheap. It's not easy. It was not cheap for Jesus. It was not easy. But it's simple to understand so that a child can understand. And we have to come as a child. There'll be a lot of people that spend eternity separated from God, as the old saying goes, the distance between the head and the heart. Because we believe it all in our head, but we've never in our heart stepped across that line. If you've not done that, I pray you would do that today. I pray you would do that right now where you're sitting, right now where you're listening. In your heart of hearts, you can do that. There's no magic words. If God tugs at your heart, you respond. When you don't respond, you're resisting and your heart becomes a little more calloused, a little more hardened. But redemption, we have been rescued, bought out of the slave market of sin, and we now belong to him. We are part of his forever family. Ephesians 1, 7 now says, in him, that is Jesus, we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Remember, grace means what? Undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor from God. Grace is God giving to man the opposite of what he deserves. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Then we're going to be talking, number two, about covenants, a covenant relationship. In the Bible, God makes unconditional and conditional covenants. A covenant is a promise or an agreement. When God makes an unconditional covenant, it's one-sided. It means he will do it, period. It has nothing to do with man. In this case, with Israel, God owns the land. It is his. And he is giving it to Israel as he promised over and over, beginning with Abraham, not because they were deserving, but because he has chosen them and he will do it. But then there were also unconditional covenants, or conditional rather covenants, that were promises based on a premise. In other words, they would be blessed if they obey and follow God. And if they didn't, they would not be blessed. Well, in the New Testament, now remember, a testament is a will. It goes into effect upon what? Death. So the death of Christ enacted the New Testament, the new will. And you are the recipient. And in this New Testament covenant, God has unconditionally, given us salvation, that is, those who believe. And we have a guaranteed home in heaven, and he will do it. It's up to him. 
Philippians 1, 6 says you can be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun that good work in you of salvation will perform it until the day that Jesus returns. John tells us that he will not lose one of his own. The Bible says nothing can separate us now from the love of God. It is unconditional. But during this life journey now, we get to choose whether we're going to obey and follow him or not. We have a free will. And so when we trust and obey, he pours out his blessings on us. When we decide we're not going to trust, we're not going to obey, then we suffer. We fall into holes. We trip down the cliff. We walk into things that we should have avoided. We don't experience the wonderful blessing that God wants to pour out. The Bible says that God waits to be gracious. He wants to bless you. But just like those of you who are parents, if you have children, which if you're a parent, that goes without saying you're not going to bless your children when they decide to you know uh johnny clean your room no okay here's an ice cream cone right that makes no sense that's not going to train that child that's not going to help the child that's not real love but ultimately god has an unconditional covenant with you of salvation and hebrews 9 15 says for this reason christ is the mediator the go-between between god and man of a new covenant or testament that those who are called saved may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died so the will is enacted and you're the recipient he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. That is the Old Testament, the law. The law said, don't do this, don't do that, do this. And we break them all. And Christ redeems us from the curse of the law. And then we're going to be talking about rest that God has promised and inheritance. God, through Abraham, from the time of Abraham, had promised Israel and I want you to see the difference. He promised Israel material, physical blessing and rest and inheritance in an earthly place, the promised land of Canaan. And it was promised, you might remember, long before it was actually received. And even though it was by grace, there was a battle to possess it. We're going to talk about that a lot in Joshua. The battle in this life to possess, experience, claim the blessings of God. Now, for us, God has promised not earthly blessings. He has promised us spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And there is a spiritual battle to possess and experience those blessings. But the power to possess and experience is from the Lord. You are part of the kingdom of God now, but there is a battle that rages in this life, in this journey on earth, and our heavenly Joshua, Jesus, leads us. But ultimately, our inheritance, our heavenly inheritance, is guaranteed. So we read in 1 Peter 1, verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope, that is an expectation, a confident expectation, through the resurrection. We've already seen Him win. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance, this is what's coming, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power 
until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time, that is when Jesus returns. And then, fourthly, we're going to see in this book of Joshua what it takes to have victory in the battle. <clears throat> in the book of Joshua, the people of Israel, ready to enter the battle, ready to take possession of their blessing, I'll tell you something, they're, they're looking at their history. They're, they're not very proud about their past. They're scared about their future. The challenge seems enormous. They have failed and doubted again and again. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you're afraid that based on your past, you're just going to keep wandering around in the desert, experiencing failure and not being faithful. We're going to see that your victory is in the Lord and in His power. In the book of Joshua, we'll see that when they trusted in the Lord's power, when they went into battle, they won. Then there were times that they decided, you know what, we can do this on our own. And they failed miserably and were defeated. The New Testament counterpart to the book of Joshua in the Old Testament is the book of Ephesians. It is the fulfillment of Joshua. And while Joshua's battle was against fierce physical armies that they could see that wanted to destroy and defeat him, our battle is a spiritual battle against unseen forces in spiritual places. We have an enemy that the Bible says a real enemy goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, the great liar, the deceiver, the schemer. But the solution is the same for Joshua as it is for us. The power is in the Lord. It is the power that can bring us victory. <clears throat> so we read in Ephesians 6.10, Finally, be strong. A lot of people grab hold of that. Yeah, i got to be strong. Look at the rest. Be strong, what? In the Lord and in His mighty power. You don't have enough, but He does. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand because the attacks come against the devil's schemes. Verse 12, for our struggle, our battle, is not against flesh and blood. It's not a physical army we see but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, I encourage you to read the rest of chapter 6 this week in Ephesians. Read it very slowly to see the armor that God has provided you. In your care group study this week and discussion, that'll be one of the questions that you'll talk about. And then lastly... Now, I have to tell you this. Many of you have an outline, and it keeps going, right? And you're thinking, oh, man, I knew once football was over, he's never going to stop. We're going to end right here. <laughs> I know that disappoints some of you, uh, but we'll get into the rest of that next week. But this last point here is about the faithfulness of God. And that's because when we are full of fear, when we're consumed with anxiety and worry, we need to remember the faithful promises of the Lord who loves us. You might want to write some of these down. Romans 8.37. Romans 8.37 says we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. How about Romans 8.31? Just read the whole chapter of Romans 8. Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can stand against us? How about Philippians 4.13? I can do all things. How? Through Christ who infuses inner strength into me. Promise after promise from God, and they bring us courage and strength. You know why? They bring us strength because He is faithful. The Bible says even when we're not, He is faithful. Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same today, tomorrow, or yesterday, today, and forever. He is called the faithful one in the last book of the Bible. Remember the verse we started with, Romans 15, 4. Would you look at it once more? For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement that they provide, 
we might have hope. The scriptures proclaim that God is faithful, that he cannot lie. He is worthy of our trust. And even when we think the odds are against us, even when our situation looks impossible, even as the storms of life are raging, we can trust our faithful God. And as we study together the book of Joshua, I hope you'll make it every week that you can. And if you miss a week, go on the website and listen to the message. And I hope you'll come to a care group. If you haven't signed up for a care group yet, see in the very back there. You see, if you wave hands, you'll see John and Chad standing back there. They're going to also be by that light post back there. And if you're not already signed up for a group, we want you to go to a group. And if you go to a group and you're like, ah, I don't know if I fit in here, then go to a different group. It's okay. There'll be a group that's just right for you. Maybe you can't make it every week. That's okay. But go when you can. And this will magnify your experience on Sunday morning. And as we study, may we be able to say as Joshua did at the end of his life when the battles were over. Look at our last verse, Joshua 23, 14. Joshua said, now I am about to go the way of all the earth. That is, he's about to die. And he says, you know, with all your heart and soul. Now he's talking to almost two million witnesses that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. I don't care if there's eight minutes to go in your game, two minutes, four quarters, no quarters. God will not fail you. He is faithful. Would you stand together with me and let's sing to the Lord.
I pray this week, beginning with this day, you would think, meditate, study, consider how faithful God is, how worthy he is of your trust. He will not fail you. He will not forsake you. Trust in him with all your heart. Don't lean or rely on your own understanding. In all your ways this week, acknowledge him, put him first, and he will guide and direct your path. May you be blessed this week. I really hope you'll be here this next week because the chapter one of Joshua has some of the greatest verses in all the Bible. You don't want to miss that. Plus, come and eat chili and leave all the soup to me. We'll see you next week.